right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Sandcast. With Triborn and <laughs> Travis Mortar, of course, and our special guest today, Delaney Nudson. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> We've been trying to get you on for a long time. Travis, then, we uh, got her. <laughs> no, <laughs> finally. It's been about six months worth of protests and claiming <laughs> that we'd have a better guest, and we finally got you on. <laughs> this is this is the you have the record for the most behind the scenes podcast probably. Well, maybe with Gabby. Yeah. I think Gabby probably has yeah. me beat there. The Pod Mama, yeah. the pod mama and then the assistant to yeah. the Pod Mama. I'll hold the record for non resident. <laughs> oh, there you exactly. That's, that's what I mean. We do have to give our listeners a heads up that if this episode does get cut short, it's because we are having well, no, we <laughs> tries having a Pod Baby. So, yeah. <laughs> which yeah, could so come any minute now. We're on call if the Pod Mama yells out my water broke or something like that <laughs> then we bail real quick maybe we take the lab mics off or maybe we take you guys with us i don't yeah, know yeah could be on we'll the road <laughs> road podcast yeah but we are uh for your season we're in our last avp coming up in hawaii and you've had a, probably a different year than i think you would have imagined when you started you're finishing as a blocker with katie spieler it's so like it's kind of like a year in review podcast, like right before the last event of the year. Like when you look back on it, like is this year gone? However, at all you would have imagined it would have gone. No, I had no idea. <laughs> if you told me that I was going to finish this season as a blocker, I probably would have laughed <laughs> and been really embarrassed because I don't think I would have considered myself to be a strong blocker. Um, but it has been so much fun and I wouldn't do it any other way. Getting the opportunity to play with Katie and to grow my game in such a unique way has been an incredible experience. I think it's super fun too that you're playing with Katie now because your first main draw came with the honeybee. Yes. And kind of, I guess tell our listeners about how you guys earned that first main draw and you did it in really similar fashion to get into uh, Manhattan. Well, I guess you didn't end up needing the wild card bid from the Chicago tournament, but I think it was kind of a fun little parallel. Yeah, it was. It's really fun because Katie was really my first partner at the professional level. We were doing the high performance USA program together. She was a year older than me, so we were only in the same group every other year. Um, but in 2014, we, I remember it really vividly and I don't really know why. And it's kind of funny now we were sitting in on the stand after practice and she was doing what she was calling flash tanning because she you get shorts tans, like really bad spandex <laughs> tan lines after college seasons. And so she was saying she was just going to like burn it off. <laughs> so she had her bathing suit. We were just hanging out in the sand and she was like, Oh, like, do you want to sign up for AVP Manhattan? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Let's give it a shot. And so we went out and played in a qualifier that was like 12 teams. <laughs> and we played two matches to get in and got to play Kerry and April, first thing, um, the draw. next day. Yeah, <laughs> we scored nine and nine. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, <laughs> we never got aced. There's been worse. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my goal, was to not get aced, and we didn't get aced. Um, but then the next year, like, we stuck together because that was such a fun experience. We stuck together, and we went through the AVP Next um, bid process. So we played all of the local AVP Nexts to win that regional bid into Manhattan. Um, so we got to bypass the qualifier that second year in 2015, and super fun to come back around this season and to do it kind of the same way with her. Um, we went to the Chicago AVP Next Gold Series, which winning that tournament gave you a bid to Manhattan. And then we also won the Seaside bid. Um, and some would say we didn't actually end up needing them. But if there were other teams that had won those tournaments, we probably would have been bumped into the qualifier if we hadn't had those bids. So maybe a chicken and the egg kind of thing. Yeah, I think right. that it was better to have them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so just, it was awesome. Yeah. And but like with you moving to blocker, did you have any expectations of like finishing the year? Like as a, because like your blocks per set were what, like second or third in, in Chicago, Chicago. I think the tournament finished. I was second in blocks per set. Dang. We've right been blocking for like Alex. two months. Yeah. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's, I think part of it lies in the fact that I didn't have any expectations of myself, so that's part of 
the reason I've been able to be so free in just taking risks because I know that like no one would expect me to know anything out there. Right. So I can do something just feeling like it's a complete risk and it might look super stupid, but nobody cares if I look stupid right. <laughs> because this is my second month blocking, you know? So it's, it's been a really fun environment to be able to develop and thrive at that level. What about the fact that you've been coaching, you know? Like, you haven't been blocking yourself, but you've been, like, sitting on the sideline. When I sat out for a while, I feel like I learned a lot, and I came back, I was like, I got, like, mental reps in, at least, yeah. you know? So, do you think that kind of applied? Like, you've been coaching girls yeah. at Pepperdine. Yeah, absolutely. I would tell anybody that the year that I spent after I graduated, coaching at Pepperdine did more for my game than uh, an entire season um, playing or practicing because of how I was able to look at the game differently and getting those I love like mm-hmm. those mental reps in yeah. and it allowed me to have s- sort of this um, perspective on the court I was able to carry it with me and realize and kind of pick up on more patterns and have a better perspective of like the flow of the game as far as two people playing together whereas if you just play and play and play yourself you only have your perspective mm-hmm. really um, and but it was funny on the flip side like how it worked its way into my change in positions, all of a sudden I'm in those positions and I've coached blockers before and said like, yeah, you need to do this with your arms, like this step, like this lineup, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm out there making the same errors. (laughs) Like, wow, this is way harder than it looks. (laughs) (laughs) Like I have so much more empathy now for those players that I've been like coaching. And I think it's going to help my ability to coach that position to have been in that, in that experience personally. like, (laughs) Listen, I know how hard it is. Exactly. You can start, you can start with that first. Yeah, <laughs> that might have been missing on the blocking side before. I know you maybe saw me play in Chicago, and I missed it. I missed it. <laughs> I've learned since then, and this is what you need to do. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it is a cool position that you're in, though, because, like you said, your year coaching did more for you as a player than like, a, like playing would have. And now, like, you playing the blocking position is going to make you a better coach. Yeah. I think that that is an awesome situation for you to be in because when you're coaching, it's not like, like, when people are working their part-time or full-time jobs, like, they're obviously not getting better at volleyball. Right. But, and when they're getting better at volleyball, they're not getting better at their jobs. Right. But you get kind of the best of both worlds, which I think is kind of a good spot to be in. Yeah, it's living the dream. I mean, both of the things that I'm doing are, well, it's the coolest thing now is that both of the jobs that I have being a professional player and being a coach are paying the bills, <laughs> like right. fairly equally at this point, which is that. pretty cool. Totally. <laughs> Part of it is because I'm a volunteer coach, so that's not actually making me a ton of money. But um, yeah, it's really cool to see the way that both of those uh, roles are helping the other. Um, I think that my playing career has been really helping my coaching career kind of in the like ability to coach technique and and like game flow and strategy but also just to relate to where the girls are at and the load that they have on themselves um having been a player at Pepperdine it makes it a lot easier for me to be a resource for them not just a volleyball resource but also like a therapist (laughs) like an emotional resource someone who's like really been in their shoes and really does understand and not 30 years ago like three years ago totally and how many girls have have you actually coached that are now on tour like a lot I feel like right um more of the girls that I played with because I played with um has there been any that that you've coached and have come out Corinne Corinne was one year behind me so my first year coaching Mm -hmm. I was a coach on the staff for her as she was playing um we had a super interesting dynamic because we were best friends and so I actually didn't do a lot of coaching on her court right um but I was more of that like empathetic like you can talk to me like right. I understand your issues I was kind of like a double agent for the <laughs> staff yeah. and the players that year because I was so close to the players right. still and it's gotten a little bit different um since well we still have Deanna and Brooke and Katie Gavin was in a couple qualifiers Gigi Hernandez like we have girls that are signing up and playing that are still at Pepperdine but as mm-hmm. far as girls that have graduated that I coached it's just Corinne okay I think yeah. soon in the next couple years where there will be in like pun fully intended, a wave of Pepperdine players. 
um, who are going to be making like Deanna Kraft is really good. Brooke Bauer is unreal. Um, she's made it to the final round of a few qualifiers. I don't think she's made it through. No, not yet. But yeah. she's made it through. Um, I think Gigi Hernandez will make it through. I think if Heidi Dyer wants to, yes. she has the skill set too. I don't know like what her post grad plans are, but I think yeah. that we'll probably see four, five, or six who probably could do the job. Yeah, I would agree. I, I would, think I would not want to be a a women's volleyball player on the pro <laughs> side because it's like every year there's a whole new wave of great players yeah. yeah back in the day it was like well I guess it, it was like how it is on the men's side like maybe one maybe two yeah. guys a year that yeah, come like, out we have like so Miles Partain and everybody's freaking out but the girls get that <laughs> yeah. like every tournament <laughs> yeah exactly I do think it's interesting to see though because on the women's side obviously the girls start playing so much younger because there's such a big club scene because there's a big college scene and so I think I don't know who would have predicted this if anybody but I think we're seeing that burnout already because if you look at the waves of college players that are coming in every year they're not huge and the sport is growing like exponentially so for us to not see like 30 or 40 new players every season I think that's an indicator that some of these girls are getting to the end of their careers and they're they're getting a little bit burnt out so yeah. sorry <laughs> no you're good I, I think that's why we see a lot of the seniors doing a lot more because like you look at a player like Skylar Caputo who has taken a third at AVP Seattle and she's like so roasted that like yeah she's pretty much finished playing yeah. for I mean at least for the time being yeah I but, think it's going to be definitely a balance for those girls because if they do off season for school and in season for school or um like preseason, like fall season for beach volleyball, and then spring is when they're actually in season. The summer is like their only time off, but then that's when the professional season is. So I think it's going to be really important as the sport grows and as both of those blocks of fall and spring become more intensive, that they f- feel the importance of balancing that summer and taking the time off that they need so that they don't lose it and can still come out and pursue that professional career if yeah. they want to. I think like a good example of that would be um, Abril Bustamante mm-hmm. at USC because she was, um, I don't know if you followed USC much this year, but she was the number one pair with Tina Gradina, mm-hmm. who just won uh, the CEV I was watching championships. Um, and she pretty much took the whole summer off. When summer first got hurt, Sarah picked her up for um, Hermosa, and, but that was like her only event. And then she just like needed to relax and just take off volleyball because it's so much. It's yeah. like pretty much a year round thing, and like you see that like with any sport that's year round, the like, kids get burnt out, yeah. or like you get overuse injuries. Like basketball, kids are tearing ACLs like, all the time now. Yeah. For sure, nowadays it's like full time professional job, even as a college player or yeah. even high school. You know, it's yeah. getting intense, like it yeah. was when. I don't know, for for some other sports. Like you hear about these basketball guys that are like, You're going to the NBA when you're yeah, you know, a kid. But for <laughs> beach volleyball it was never that. It was always like, Oh, that's a pro sport? I didn't even know that. Yeah. Until you get to college, you're like, Oh, I guess I could play. Yeah. Now it's it's getting for real. Which is why I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited about like what's to come. Yeah. It's fun to see all the growth and all like the new names just like messing up main draws and kind of <laughs> making it crazy. Like you look at the contenders bracket, like Mel, Melissa Humana Paredes, and Sarah Pavin had to play Kelly Larson and Emily Stockman for, like, ninth oh, in yeah. Chicago. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. That's a gnarly contender. Like, that's, like, I mean, Kelly and Emily took a silver and a four-star, and they were playing the world champs for ninth yeah. in an yeah. the The Yeah, and the finals was the world champs final, yeah. right? In how many tournaments now? Two or three? Right? Yeah, well, they so the finals in two of the events were the World Champs finals, but Sarah and Mel played April and Alex in the second round in Chicago. Oh, right. The way the seating worked out. So you had the yeah. World Championship finals, like, you know, I don't know, 13th? <laughs> right. Which is crazy. Yeah. Have you ever That's played insane. against someone? You have played against people that you've coached. Is that a funny dynamic? It is a really funny dynamic. Um, last year in shouldn't have taught him that. Hermosa, <laughs> <laughs> last year in the Hermosa qualifier, I ended up playing um, Gigi 
Hernandez and Heidi Dyer in the second round, and then I played Skylar Caputo and Tori Van Winden in the round to get in. Tough draw. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't an easy draw. I can't call them an easy draw because I coached them. You know, right. I know they're good players. <laughs> um, but I think that there's a little bit of a dynamic that is to my advantage in that situation because I've not only coached them, but I've watched them so much. I know their game so well, and all that time that I've spent watching them, they haven't watched me. You know, I still have all my secrets, and I know what they can do. Right. Which means that I do totally have to respect them on the court. Um, I think that it, it plays more to my advantage in that case. Is it, like, uh, is it hard to, like, get jacked up to play one of your own players? Because, like, you can't... Not that you are big into, like, talking trash and, like, demeaning other players, but... Yeah, I could totally there is, see like, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's, like, an element of just, like, you know... You do have to beat them. Yeah. It is a bummer when you have to knock out a player that you would really see, like you would really love to see succeed. But I do have to admit that I love the trash talk element of it. I love not like the aggressive demeaning like banter, but I like the clever, witty like one liners. Mm-hmm. Like I think Skylar made a great play last year in the Hermosa qualifier. I was like, I taught her that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I love that dynamic. And you can be like that when you're playing with people that you're comfortable with. And I think that lends itself super well when you're playing against players that you've coached or playing against someone that has coached you because you're so comfortable with them and so I think that the game the talk in the game gets way more fun um and yeah it's a bummer to have to knock them out and there's obviously pressure because you feel like you should knock them out but um I think there's give and take there and I think it's still fun yeah and you it's like you were kind of dancing around with the qualifiers you were like the perennial number one seed like every qualifier (laughs) and this year for the most part you were out of them how different of a dynamic is it going into like a year well you didn't know at the beginning of the year that you'd be out of qualifiers like you were stoked when when you and Allie partnered up in Austin you were like holy cow (laughs) yeah that's a miracle (laughs) but for the last (laughs) what you had Hermosa Manhattan Chicago you were straight in straight in straight in so how different of a dynamic is that for you or just does it make a Bentley settling in Does it make, like, a mental difference how you approach a tournament? Um, I think it definitely does. I think that as far as the mental side goes, um, before playing with Katie, I probably would have said, after playing with Allie in Austin and after qualifying with Emily and playing in Seattle in the main draw. Hartong. Emily Hartong, yeah. Um, being in with Allie was the first time I'd been automatic main draw on just points alone and not have like qualified through some other channel. Um, and it was interesting to feel unprepared on Friday because I hadn't played the day before. We had obviously touched a ball, but it was a super different dynamic um, playing against largely teams who have who had been playing the day before. Um, but then in Seattle with Emily, when we came out and played um, Kelly Larson and Emily Stockman first thing, we felt super comfortable because we played the day before. We played three matches, three good matches. And yeah, like, really good. We felt super um, ironed out, like every all the kinks, like super smooth. Um, and so after that, I probably would have told you that I think it's an advantage to play the qualifiers, especially if you feel confident. Like I felt confident that I'd make it through having mm-hmm. been like the one seed in half the qualifiers last season. Um, but after playing with Katie, she has taught me um, a lot on the mental side about like the confidence to know that you can win. And I've seen that in her and learned that from her on the court in a way that I hadn't really experienced it before. And it's hard to explain, but she gets on the court and she wins. And to the point where we can be down three points at the end of a set and I'm not worried because like Katie wins. Mm -hmm. She makes those plays at the end. And it's been really cool to be able to learn from her and adapt that into my own game to know, like, with that internal confidence. Like, people say it all the time, like, you're never out of the game, a lot of game left, right. like, that's why we play. Like it's, But it's all just words until you feel it. And right. playing with Katie, I've been able to, like, feel what that feels like, and it's been incredible. We are going to take a quick second to pause for a commercial break from our sponsors who keep the show moving forward as always, as do you, the listeners. You guys are by far the most important part of this show. I uh, just wanted to give a huge thank you to everyone who always says hi at the beach and says thanks for the show, thanks for all the information for putting it out. And honestly, it, I almost feel bad taking gratitude and thanks because it's just a blast. It's an absolute blast for me and try to just talk volley, and it's an absolute blast to know that you guys are listening. So a huge thank you to you guys, the listeners. You are the reason that we do the show in the first place and the reason that it keeps going on. 
Uh, another big reason is the fact that you are still supporting our sponsors, um, one of our favorites, obviously. The ball maker of them all, Wilson Volleyball. The AVP plays with it. The CBVA plays with it. The college girls play with it. Everyone plays with Wilson Volleyball, except for the FIVB, who uses them in Costa. But we're not going to worry about that for now, because for now, it's the end of AVP season, which means that your balls are probably a little bit beat up and that you probably need some replacements. So order some at wilsonvolleyball.com and use our discount code WILSONSAND for 20% off. All right, that'll get you a bunch of new volleyballs that you'll need heading into the off season at the end of season here uh, as it winds down. Our next sponsor, now all the Beats players listen to this, you need, you need something to do with all your prize money. Might as well go over to Pacific Coast Wealth Management and hit up our guys over there. They can help you out with a retirement portfolio. They can put your money in all the right spots. They're great guys. They know beach volleyball. They're the ones who help put on the Laguna Beach Open. So hit up our guys at Pacific Coast Wealth Management and talk to them about your finances today. And last but certainly not least of our sponsors, we have Firefly Recovery. And God bless those guys at Firefly because they are the only reason that my knees are still intact at this point in the season. Travel, you can. It, it isn't just a, a pain to travel anymore. You can actually recover while you travel. You can just strap them on your knees, and it moves the blood flow around. So you, when you step off the plane, you're not all stiff, and you don't need a full day or two to get ready to play. You are just ready to rock and roll as soon as you step off the plane. If you are an office worker, you can slap those things on while you're in the office, and then it'll go. I've gotten a lot of messages about Firefly and how great they are, so give them a try today at Firefly Recovery. And now, back to the show. Mm-hmm. Is she the first partner that you felt that with? Not trying to like throw any other your partner. I didn't know <laughs> if like you had really like vibe like that before with anybody else. To that extent. Yeah, I think that I felt really comfortable on the court with a lot of players. Yeah. Um, but I've never felt as excited and as, um, I guess, in the zone as I feel when I'm playing with Katie. And I think I do have to say part of it is probably because of the change in positions and the lack of expectations that come with that, because I feel like I can play so free. Um, but I think that she definitely has encouraged that with me too. Um, like just being able to laugh and have fun and work hard, which are all my favorite parts of the game. She loves doing that too. And so it feels super comfortable to be out there on the court with someone who has the exact same goals as I do. Yeah. I I could definitely, say the same thing with when I got to partner with Trevor. I was like, yeah. whoa, this, is, this isn't Johnny Hyden, <laughs> <You know? laughs> who at, at times could get a little grumpy. Um, he, you know, he wants everything done a certain way. Yeah. And then so I went from you know, being somewhat the most specialized I could be, just full-time blocking all the time, and I, was, I had my role very dialed in. You know, I knew what my role was exactly. John told me what my role was. Yeah. Uh, to going with Trevor where we're just weighing it. Like, we're just going to split block because we can. Yeah. We don't really have a strategy here, which we, we're, we like, barely moving past not having a strategy right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, we, we just play. But but uh, that's what I like about it is, like, it's so much more fun and refreshing. Yeah. And you get, like, a different look. And now this week I played left-handed on the right <laughs> side. I'm a right-handed full-time left-sider defense. full-time blocker and it was full-time defense, left-side, right-side. <laughs> left-handed right-sider this week and I got a jump serve in. <laughs> so now it's been extra spiced up for me. <laughs> but it's so much easier to take those risks and to be uncomfortable yeah. if you're on the court with someone that you're comfortable with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and like our sport is like one of those sports where you're you have to get outside of your comfort zone a lot and, like, switch it up. And, and yeah. if your partner is hurt or something, you know, there's only two people. Yeah. So you have to, like, be able to change. And, and it's, like, that mental game where you're, like, all right, I'm going to give myself a little bit of, like, freedom to make mistakes here because I'm doing something new. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. And I feel like I'm doing that, like, all the time. Because yeah. I'm, like, well, now I'm playing, but I have this pressure on me and this and that. So I'm just going to let myself yeah. have a few hours because of this. Right. And I just keep making up new excuses for myself. <laughs> it's freeing. It is freeing, yeah. yeah. I, I suppose we're just kind of like trying to find those things all the time. Yeah. yeah. The mental game is crazy yeah. from match to match. Yeah. yeah. I think with you two, I feel like people, a lot of people who just watch you and Katie play um, probably wouldn't think that you're two of the most competitive people <laughs> because you're always laughing and smiling, like having like the best time. 
And so I was talking to somebody, and, and they were talking about your body language and that they would never know what the score was if you could be down 10 or up 10, and you guys would still look the same way, and you're still, like, booping over on two and on one, <laughs> like, doing all this stuff. I feel like it's it's fun to have that connection where, like, you both know that, like, you're going to do whatever it takes to win and that yeah. you're super competitive, but you can have a blast doing it, and that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, I think that if you don't have fun playing this game, then why are you playing this game? I really don't see any mm-hmm. other, like, viable reason to be playing professional beach volleyball unless you have fun playing beach volleyball. There's not enough money in it. There's not right. the fame, you know, that you're not going to be recognized walking on the street. If that's what right. you're playing for, you're not going to get that. And so if you can't have fun, like, why are you doing it? Yeah, so right. it's been fun. It's been awesome to play with Katie because she gets that, that if it's not fun, why are we doing it? And so you, and you can have fun even if you're down, like... 8 to 17 like we were in Chicago Um, because we know that we're giving it our best and we're taking risks and we're trying to get better and we're trusting each other and what's the funnest part for you about playing or about playing with Katie (laughs) either make the same question right now right true true um it's funny because I would tell people uh, probably up until this last couple months that my favorite part about playing beach volleyball was running down a highline shot. Like (laughs) I lived to run down highline shots and I haven't been running down any highline shots and I'm still having a blast. So I don't, you can feel dig a highline. (laughs) You can feel dig a highline. I can't, you (laughs) can't. I don't know. The jury's still out on that. Um, but I think that just the ability to push my body and to work really hard is my favorite part. I love getting to the end of a rally, like a long rally where you're like sandy and you've grinded out and like a bunch of one handed scramble plays and win or lose. I can't come up from that, like a rally like that, not smiling because Mm -hmm. that is so fun. Just working and like leaving it all on the court and even just one rally, I think is my favorite part. I feel like watching you and Katie, that happens like every other play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the other team's probably team. pissed about it. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that that's like one of times. our advantages because we love playing in those rallies, mm-hmm. so we're not afraid of them, you know? And we'll get in it and we'll grind it out with you. And I think that we come out on top of most of those because we enjoy being in that pressure and in that hard work um, that kind of gets on people's nerves. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys kind of train that way? Like to be able to play that style of volleyball, like long rallies, scrappy and all that, or is that just kind of how you guys play? So it ends up being that way. I think more, it's more that we just play like that. Mm-hmm. It's like with Katie, you can't not work hard. Yeah, like <laughs> if you have someone next to you that's busting her butt, you like better Katie be in does, shape like, cause <laughs> she's going to dig a lot of balls that you got to oh, yeah. run exactly. and chase yeah. set and then get back to the net. Yeah, we do. Um, and I remember this from early on when I was playing with Katie a couple of years ago, when I would go up to Santa Barbara and train with her, we would literally show up, warm up and play sets to 21 for two hours and we wouldn't drill, you know, we just played. So you put yourself in a lot of those, um, undrillable situations more often and that was something that we did a lot when we first partnered together in the middle of this season when we would train we would just play then like obviously if we had a team that wanted to do some drills we would do some drills but if anyone was open to just play games of 21 we would just do that and we would put our team in those like unorthodox situations as often as we could and recognize that you don't know what's going to happen so you just have to work hard every time yeah right. it's not like you can drill let's drill the 15th dig of the rally. Yeah. Right. I'm on my stomach crawling to poke it up. Then, right. go, then we play it out. <laughs> That's a good point. You can't drill that. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to play those ones. You can have those correction drills. I remember where the coach, you make an error, and whatever yes. error you make, the coach gives you the same ball back. I loved those drills. Those are fun, but yeah. those will crush you because yeah. they're like, they're endless. I made like five yeah. errors to end this <laughs> rally and the rally won't end yeah. until I end it like right. with a good play, yeah. <laughs> which is good, but yeah, those ones get tired, tiring was, for sure. It was really funny talking to um, Carissa after her and Jace won Austin because mm-hmm. she was like, wow, like I played a lot more matches in Austin, but I was way less tired. <laughs> I wasn't playing with Katie because Katie just yeah, digs yeah. so many balls. And she's she like, digs and digs and digs. Yes. <laughs> she, yeah, she was like the other team. Like sometimes they just score points on the first try, and that never happened. To Katie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm getting, I'm having to get used to that, and it's been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think that you'd be? It's like when you and Katie partnered up. It was kind of like not like a last minute thing, but it was sort of like a weird situation because like her and Brittany were playing, and Brittany like wasn't sure if she wanted to play, and Hartong had just gone to Gina at Urango. Yeah. 
And so you guys are like, hey, like we're good friends. We've done this before. Let's yeah. do it. Did you think that like one you did, like you've had a career year since when I mean, you guys yeah. have won like two really big tournaments with Chicago and Seaside. You got a seventh, which is a career finish. Like, yeah. has this like been at all what you expected it to be when you and Katie were like, "Hey, nuts and Spieler, run it back." <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I actually, well, I asked Katie if she wanted to play the East Beach CBBA before anything happened with partnerships for Hermosa, just because I kind of wanted to play in it and that I thought it would be a fun thing to do with her because that's like where our partnership really blossomed was up at East <laughs> Beach, you know. Um, to get her back up to her home courts and to kind of like have a little throwback run with her. And then when she reached out about possibly doing Hermosa because like she had so much fun together, I was like, whoa, this is awesome. Like we'd be straight in. This is going to be so (laughs) fun. Like I was just stoked on the novelty of getting to play with a main draw player. Um, and obviously it was so much fun to play with her. Um, but then we didn't really do that well in Hermosa. (laughs) So I was like, Kind Shoot. of a false narrative, because <laughs> you guys beat Zana, Muna, and Chrissy Jones, yeah. 21-14, 21-10. Yes. They we, went to the semifinals. Yeah. So, so oh, we, <laughs> you made it, you were the ones that made them play 14 yeah. matches or something. <laughs> yeah, we knocked them down first thing, um, but then we couldn't really close out that Friday for ourselves, um, and so I was like, shoot, like, this was really fun. Um, I'm sure that she's going to move on to someone else. Um, but she had a coach with her, Jason, who has worked with her for a little bit, I think the last couple of years up in Santa Barbara. And afterwards, we, I guess our finish was a 17th. Um, and he was saying, like, you got a 7th here last year with Carissa, and you were not this happy. And so it was interesting to see that someone else could kind of weigh in on mm-hmm. our partnership and like the potential that we had just because of our chemistry and like the way that we can play together. Um, and that I could kind of help foster that enjoyment of the game for her, just like she was doing it for me. So yeah, would not have expected that we would finish out the season together, but couldn't be any happier that we are. Yeah. That's such an underestimated thing in our sport is like chemistry. Yeah. Like people are always like points and like, yeah. well, how good is this person? What's their potential? How yeah. is- you know, how good are they going to make me or whatever, you know? But at the end of the day, it's like, you got to do all this stuff with them. You got to travel with them yeah. and, and practice with them, grind with them in the hot days yeah. when it's really difficult and you're in a bad mood or whatever, when you're jet lagged. And like that over a season, if you look at your finishes over a season, that's going to help yeah. big time. Yeah. And I think people will just totally undervalue that absolutely and you see it a lot in the qualifiers obviously because everyone's trying to find like that next break so they end up making a lot of lateral jumps just maybe for points or maybe for um I don't know someone that they see who has a higher ceiling and more Mm -hmm. potential but at the end of the day like all of those are superficial shifts I think it happens at the top level at the higher levels too for sure because you'll see teams that are doing really well and on paper they're good but by the end of the year they're they burn out yeah. or they're not getting along. You see them just quiet on the court. Probably yeah. more with the guys. Uh, yeah. the, they show it <laughs> yeah. more, you know, on the court. Yeah. Yeah. Where they're just like kind of turn away and just be like, I don't want to hang out with you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but like, how are you going to play the, the last fourth of the season like that, you know, right. and actually get good finishes and finish out of the year? Um, so I think that's super important. But when yeah. I moved here, I, when I was living in Huntington, mm-hmm. uh, a guy named John Alvarez, who he was good friends with Ty Trambley and was kind of in with that crew. It was one of the first guys I met like when I moved out here, and he said that one of the most important things about a partnership is the ability to lose well together. Yeah. Which, I mean, when you look at it, only one team doesn't lose. Yeah, right. And for the most totally. part, like in double limbs, the team that wins has probably, unless you're April and Alex, has probably lost at some point. Mm-hmm. In the weekend, so like you, know, you look at Jake and Taylor, and I think two of their three wins they lost really early. Yeah, like you have to figure out how to lose together if you're going to be partners. I think that's one of the things that you know, in retrospect. So like me playing with Miles for I think we played like eight, eight or nine straight tournaments together, mm-hmm. kind of bridging 2018 and 2019, and that like we were really good at that. And that, like, Miles would be really bummed, and he'd go off for a couple hours, and then we'd go back, and, like, we'd get some beers, and, like, we'd be great. Mm-hmm. And, like, we're really good friends. I think being able to lose together is a super valuable part of the sport that no one really considers. Yeah. Yeah. You Absolutely. Got, you got to suck it up sometimes and, like, figure out what the priority is in terms of, like, okay, you lost, but the priority here is to make sure that this doesn't affect our next tournament yeah. as a partnership. So you start figuring out ways to do that, and... Or make sure that it affects it in a good way. 
they go, oh, yeah. we can right, extract right, right. some right. good out of this mm-hmm. instead of just being like, you suck. No, you suck right. worse. Because <laughs> yeah. that's what happens a lot. I think that the most important part is the ability to take accountability because if you see yeah. like those players that make all those jumps around a partner is essentially it boils down to the fact that they think they could do they could do better in a partner Mm -hmm. you know they probably look at the loss more on their partner and they're going to try to find a better partner someone who can do better for them whereas if you can take that accountability on yourself and recognize that there's always something that you can do better it's going to be way easier for you guys as a partnership to deal with that loss yeah that's one of the things that i think is kind of funny just observing you and katie after a loss where you guys fight over accountability. Like, no, 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 it was my fault. I right. should have put it away. And Katie was like, no, 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 like, I had three shots. It was my fault. And you're like, no. <laughs> you're, like, fighting to take charge of, like, whose fault it was. Well, it was frustrating for me at the beginning because as a non-blocker, I was like, are you kidding me? How do you think you can take accountability for this right. game? I made so many errors as a blocker, mm-hmm. you know? So it was absurd to me that I, like, that she would be trying to take any accountability for that <laughs> loss. Um, but that's something that I've been able to learn from her too, is that like you, you always have a partner out there and right. there's always something that, that you can do, even if it's in the intangibles to help your partner out. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Where do you see your future? Like as a volleyball player, do you like blocker, defender, split blocking? Or, I mean, obviously you probably haven't taken time to think about it cause you're a blocker <laughs> right now and you're getting really good at it, but you also beat the best team in the world as a defender in New York last year. So <laughs> There's that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I haven't really thought about, like, where I want to go, what position I want to pursue, like, for a career in the long run. But I definitely can say that I'm really enjoying the learning curve of being a blocker right now. Um, it's it's amazing. It's been amazing in the tournaments that we've played to feel and to see Im- improvement in just one event. Like, I remember we went to the Chicago Gold um, AVP Next um, right before Hermosa and we won it and I left that beach thinking wow I got so much better today like and not even in a practice situation where you're like drilling things but just in a playing situation I like felt and experienced myself like seeing things better, making better moves, feeling like in those split second like making the right decisions and that has continued on in, in the um, tournaments we've played since. I felt like I got better in Seaside. I felt like I got better in Manhattan. I felt like I got better in Chicago. And so I don't know that I would want to give up those feelings, mm-hmm. um, at least maybe until I hit that plateau as a right. blocker that yeah. I'll <laughs> <laughs> revisit the defending. But I've been really enjoying that experience. It's been uh, invigorating. Where do you think that's come from? Like, looking back, like, why are you making those leaps and bounds right now in terms of, like, how you prepared to get there, you know? You know what I mean? Like, looking back, and it's like, sometimes I'm like, damn it, I wish I knew how I did that, or or why (laughs) why that worked, so that I could repeat it. But now I'm like, I did something good, but now I'm back at square one. Yeah. I'm I'm on the plateau, or whatever, you know, sometimes. Right, yeah. I think that there's a lot of factors that go into it. Mm -hmm. I think, obviously... um, having zero expectations of myself right, helps right, because course. anything that I do good, I'm like, hey, I'm getting better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think Katie plays a big role in that and that she has kind of, she lets me play free and allows me to take those risks mm-hmm. too. Um, I think there's some, something huge in that ability to just take a huge risk, to take a huge, to make a huge move, to make a random crazy play and mm-hmm. know that like, I'm not going to turn and see my partner rolling her eyes at me, you know? Like, she's going to be like, all right, next ball, like, let's side out. Like, love the thought, love the idea. Um, And I think also having coached gives me the ability to see the game in a bigger perspective. Um, I think watching so much volleyball has been able to... um, I have a lot of those mental reps like we were talking about earlier, Mm -hmm. even as, as playing as a defender, but I've watched a lot of blockers, and so... I think in those moments, I think I have those logged back yeah, in, my, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in my mind totally. that help me um, put those into practice a little earlier mm-hmm. instead of having to start from square one, figuring it out in the moment by myself. Yeah. With you being a coach, like obviously you've mentioned a few times how big that's been for your development, but you've also been surrounded 
by some of the most like brilliant coaches. Like yeah. when you played at Pepperdine, you had Nina Matthews, yeah. who's like you walk down the Manhattan Pier and it's just like, hey, Nina Matthews, hey, Nina Matthews, oh, <laughs> Nina Matthews again. Yeah. And you got to play under her for all four years, yes. right? And yeah. then you've been coaching with Marcio, who has coached Carrie Walsh, yeah. um, is anymore, but like was with her for a long time. Like, how big has that been for your development as a player and a coach to be surrounded by like two of the most brilliant minds in the game? Yeah, I I think that. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously huge. If you can learn from the best, you're going to be the best. And I have obviously had an incredible opportunity to work with Nina and to work with Marcio, but it goes even back beyond that. In the USA program, I got to work with Jose Loyola. I got to work with Anna Collier. I got to work with, work with Barb Fontana. Um, Jeez. Yeah, like, I, I, the, <laughs> the people that have coached me, like, honestly, I'm not representing them well enough. Because <laughs> I, if, they, if they're not right. helping me out, like, I don't know where else I can turn. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, I've had huge resources in that. Um, I've worked with some of the best coaches that I think there are. Um, and I got to throw John Daze in there, too, because he worked with Carrie and April and Marcio for the Rio Olympics, and he worked with me and Jess Sikora last season for mm-hmm. most of the AVP season. So um, I worked a lot, like, one-on-one sometimes with him, too. And I, I've learned so much working as a player under those coaches, but it's also, it has been an incredible experience coaching with Nina and coaching with Marcia and coaching with John, um, to see behind the scenes, you know, what they, what they value and what they think and what they take away from practice and what, what is important to them. And when we leave a day at the beach, like what actually resonated with them and what they were able to just kind of like brush off because of Nina's 30 years of experience, you know, she knows if a player is just having a bad day or if that's something that we really need to dig into. So I think that it's helped on, on both levels to be able to play under amazing coaches and to be able to coach with such amazing coaches. I kind of like, um, the story of sort of how Nina found you. Or you found Nina. Because I feel like your whole career you've had this sort of like under the radar element in a sense. And I feel like you're starting to break that at the moment. You know, you and Katie had a seventh and like you've upset like a lot of really good teams. But Mm -hmm. you were in high school, you were really under the radar. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. um, In high school, I played at Valencia High School and... um, the Santa Clarita Valley high school sports are a huge deal. So I actually had a really awesome high school sport experience. Like we had a newspaper in our valley that would run stories on our high school sports. And like we were one of the better teams in the valley. So we had a lot of success. And so it was like a really cool experience. But then when you take it outside of that valley and look at the real world of getting recruited <laughs> for college, like I was a late bloomer. Um, so my sophomore year, which is when a lot of the recruiting happens, I didn't play club because I didn't want to get ridden off. So I played with my dad's boys varsity team. I practiced with them five days a week, jumping and hitting on a men's net, digging guys, like, which I think that probably helped. it was huge <laughs> for my game. But then I was behind in a lot of the recruiting. Mm. So those top programs like UCLA, USC, like the big schools, they were done. So um, I was obviously playing beach. I actually started playing beach before I played indoor because my parents met playing beach volleyball and they were playing co-ed and playing doubles like the whole time I was growing up they would like drag us to the beach and we would have like play dates with the other parents like kids (laughs) so I grew up around it um and so I started playing beach before I played indoor um so I was always playing beach throughout high school just in the summers it was that was my game Um, And so when beach became a college sport, it was something that I definitely wanted to pursue, but there was really nothing, um, there was no formula for like how you get recruited as a beach volleyball player because it was so new. So I was mostly talking to indoor schools who had beach programs that were up and coming. Um, And I did reach out to UCLA and Pepperdine and FSU and I just like got no's. You know, like, we're done. We're done recruiting. Because they weren't looking at recruiting beach players yet, and they were done with their indoor recruiting. And all I had at that point to send was indoor film. So I was like, hey, this is me. Like, watch me play indoor, but I want to play beach. <laughs> so right, like, yeah. What are they going to do? No, we're done recruiting for indoor. <laughs> like, okay, got it. But my mom was like, hey, now that you have some beach film, like, send them again. I was like, no, they said no. <laughs> <laughs> right. But she coerced me. She convinced me. And... So I sent a follow-up email to Nina at Pepperdine, and um, I had just, uh, me and Sierra Sanchez, who ended up playing at FSU, we had just upset uh, Marymount High School in the club 
beach volleyball league that we were playing in at Valencia. And Nina, being from um, Manhattan, Manhattan area, she like rec- would recognize that school. So my mm-hmm. mom was like, here, you upset this great team. Send it to her. It'll stand out. Give it right. a shot. I was like, okay, fine. And it worked. So <laughs> she came out and watched a couple of my beach tournaments and took a chance on me. And to this day, I still don't know what she saw in me because I'm watching as we recruit. Um, and, like, Pepperdine has their pick, you know? Like, they can pick from the top players in the country of beach pro, like beach players. And I was, other than Pepperdine, I was looking at San Jose State to go play indoor. Like, I was not a top-level recruit. So, uh, like, I, I feel more blessed and more lucky than anything else that that I was able to have that opportunity and that she was she felt confident enough in whatever she saw to take that chance on me when someone takes a chance on you like I know that you felt like a little bit of pressure when Katie was like hey let's play yeah oh my god I have to learn how to like block (laughs) and like Katie's had a lot of success you felt a little bit a little bit of pressure there did you feel any of that same then get like getting that offer from Pepperdine, you're like, holy cow, like I gotta perform now that Nina's taking the shot on me, like a relatively like unproven player. Yeah. Um I think a little bit. Um but it was also kind of a unique situation because the sport was so new. Um we didn't really have any expectations. You know, even at Pepperdine, like they were obviously a, a standout beach program, but beach was growing, and there we had so many returners my freshman year, um, and so it was it was a little bit intimidating, but I think the it kind of helped me ease into it that most of our players were indoor players, and so my first off season at Pepperdine, I literally had one on three practices with Nina. It was me and. Kendall Hedick and Leanna Schroeder and Sophie Asprey for a little bit. Um, and she would just drill us. And, like, I was able to kind of rise to the top of that freshman group, which gave me a lot of confidence going into our season when those girls from indoor came out to the beach. Um, so that unique situation was kind of probably helpful in overcoming that pressure that would come with, with that experience. Um, but I definitely felt it, again, playing with Katie (laughs) (laughs) yeah definitely felt it there and there was there was no easing into that it was like right away we're gonna we're gonna run Hermosa um it's good to recognize (laughs) that you perform under that type of pressure you know you can almost create it for yourself now yeah (laughs) right yeah I think we were talking to um Jess Granquist uh Travis's roommate the other day and she was like do you still get nervous like, do you still feel pressure when you're playing? And I thought about it for a little bit, and I, because I was like, yeah, I definitely do. But right. um, it's been like my mentality on it has changed from like, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous, I'm feeling so much pressure, to realizing that I'm gonna feel pressure every single time I step mm-hmm. on the court, to see how fast I can break through it and get comfortable on the court, whether mm-hmm. it's like until the technical timeout or whether it's the first 10 points or whether it's the first side change. Like if I'm feeling comfortable by the second side change, I'm like, okay, we're cruising. And so that's like the little competition or game that I play with myself in regards to pressure is just acknowledging that I'm going to be nervous every time I step on the court and seeing how fast I can get comfortable and break through those nerves and acknowledging that it's, it doesn't mean that anything's wrong that I'm nervous. It's probably good because it means I care so much. Yeah. Um, and it's going to give me that like extra effort and the extra work, but just being able to like kind of harness it and use it as yeah. soon as possible. And it's like not being scared of it, like owning yeah. it, right? Yeah. Like I feel like I I got to the point where I'm like nervous if I don't feel nervous. I'm like, yeah. oh crap, yeah. I'm way too relaxed. Yeah. Like I need it. I need to feel nervous here. Yeah. And then if you are nervous, you're like, I feel like shit right now. <laughs> <laughs> but from experience, I know that. Once the serve goes up, I'll be ready. Yeah. Because I feel this way. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting. One of the coolest things I've heard about nerves is um, I was listening to a Michael Gervais podcast mm-hmm. and he had on Julie Foudy. And she's like one of the best U.S. soccer players of all time. And she was saying that, um, you know, everyone has butterflies. Like you just have to teach them to fly in order. And which <laughs> right, I thought yeah. was like kind of a cool way to, yeah, to totally. do that. And like this year I've played in 
gosh, I've probably played in 30 tournaments this year. And so there was a point in the middle of the season where, like, I would go into a tournament and I just would not care mm-hmm. at all. And, like, I stopped being nervous. And, like, that, like, scared me. I was like, holy cow, like, I just don't care. Right, yeah, And yeah. then when I got nervous again, I was like, oh, like, I feel like alive. Like totally. these, these nerves are great. So now, like when I get nervous, I, I like get sort of excited about it. I'm like, okay, like I really care about this. Like this is really cool to have this feeling because when you think about people who are not being able to play sports for a living, they don't get that rush. Yeah, and totally. I think like when you look at it that way, like we get this rush of emotion that's so rare to have at this phase of our lives that like it's a really cool thing that like we have this much on the line. It's like, fun. Right. I don't know. It yeah. just makes you feel totally. alive. Yeah. There was a moment in <laughs> Chicago last year when I was playing with Jess um, where I was back to serve and I felt terrible. I was <laughs> terrified. And in my head, I was like, this is living. Like, this is a rush that people don't get. Like, this is right. a privilege to feel this way. And I think in that moment was when that shift kind of happened, like, to not kind of fight against the nerves but to embrace it and to appreciate it yeah. and instead just like try to use it or however For you sure. can yeah i feel like after when i have to get a real job i'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> i'm either gonna be depressed or i'm gonna find something that's, go to the beach is a real job <laughs> i gotta go business Damn it. put all of my money on the line like, let's go let's get this still get that thrill adrenal, adrenal <laughs> adrenal i think all beach players get into real estate public speaking like <laughs> yeah. it's just tons of people <laughs> yeah. you and act you and gabby could like oh i'll go into acting yeah, get into as acting. a terrible actor <laughs> <laughs> that'll make me nervous <laughs> Doing auditions, you're like, oh god, this is like worse than service even fourteen thirteen. I'm really bad at this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I know we don't have, we don't want to keep you for too long, because um, I mean, Gabby could pop any second. <laughs> yeah, really. And, uh, and we got a barbecue. And we got a barbecue. Um, but I do want to make sure that we do bring up the onesie. So that's kind <laughs> oh, of like yeah. your, you have like two signature trademarks. I think the onesie and the Killer Loop sunglasses that not many people rock anymore. <laughs> If you could uh, give our listeners the background on the onesie and the killer loops, I think that would be uh, a pretty good way to start to close it's it out. good branding, um, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wear killer loops because they were my grandpa's. Um, that killer exact loop, pair? Yeah. Whoa. Killer loop used to sponsor the tour, like, way back when. <laughs> um, and my grandpa reffed on the tour, and so did my aunt, actually. And so there were a couple pairs that were floating around, um, that I was able to collect. And, wow, that's sick. Um, and so I love, I love it when people comment on them. I love it, like, just remembering that I'm wearing that because it kind of brings me back to my roots and, like, mm-hmm. recognizing that this is not just me, but there's so much more to this game. And, um, like, the history that I have of beach volleyball in my family, I think that it's just a really cool, fun thing. And I love repping, like, the retro style, too. I think that's really fun. And that ties into the one piece also. Um, I have always, like, been more on the modest side when I've competed in my faith, my religion, it's really, like, modesty standards are really encouraged, and Mm -hmm. so when I was growing up, um, my mom will say strongly discouraged me from wearing bikinis when I would play, um, which was... Um, it didn't always go over very well because (laughs) one pieces were not coming back into style 10 years ago, like they are now. So I felt like such a sore thumb sticking out in my (laughs) one piece bathing suit. Um, but somewhere along the lines, I was able to really kind of embrace it as a unique thing that helped me stand out. Um, and I, I love that they're coming back into style. Right. Um, but I also love that that I get to be an example to other girls that you don't have to wear a bikini. Totally. To feel confident and comfortable and to feel beautiful. Um, You can wear whatever you want, whatever you feel comfortable in, and you don't have to, like, conform or wear whatever, like, all these other girls are wearing um, because sometimes it pushes the limits, and I think that it's, like, super revealing. (laughs) Totally. And super uncomfortable to be, like, tugging (laughs) on all these different little parts of your bathing suit all the time, and I think that... um, in a sport where we are pushing our bodies like so much to the limit in so many extreme positions, like comfort has to come (laughs) at at, like in one of those, um, higher priorities. And I've found that wearing a one piece bathing suit. Um, I, it's funny because 
I joke that I would probably feel more uncomfortable if my visor fell off than if I had to play in a bikini because I just feel more uncomfortable if my whole forehead is showing than if my <laughs> stomach was showing. But um, it's definitely more of a comfortable situation for me to be in a one-piece bathing suit, feeling comfortable, not having to tug on any of my, like, mm-hmm. um, my bathing suit. But I also want to make a plug here that there is so much more room for advertising. Oh, on a one piece yeah. bathing suit all of the guys board shorts are That's like so they're like billboards you know there's so much room and I'm just waiting for someone to want to put their pattern on my one piece bathing suit you, you gotta go for the, uh, like the blank billboard with it your ad here your ad here yeah. exactly I love Joe Lynn that they've been supporting me with like their mm-hmm. awesome one pieces and I've been wanting to talk to them to see if they could do like a custom pattern but no one has wanted to put it on there yet Maryland flag onesie. Hint, hint. Just, I'm just hint, throwing hint. it out there. Maryland flag onesie. Come Sand, on, Jolene. Sandcast. We got to get some patches. Sandcast maybe. onesie. Sandcast onesie. Maybe we'll make that happen. So now that you've been on, we are allowed to I'm officially not, sponsor you. I might we're, wear that. We're holding off the sponsorship money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our, our millions in Sandcast sponsor money. <laughs> I love it. Now we have our, our final question for every guest. If you had to give. One piece of advice to an up-and-coming beach volleyball player. What would that piece of advice be? You have to, you have to, to this. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. you have to have had come up with something uh, <laughs> after hearing it. Um, my biggest advice for someone who's never played volleyball before or someone who's or Someone who could be up-and-coming, someone who maybe Wants someone from Pepperdine's listening right now, and you had to give them one piece of advice. It could be kind of any demographic you'd be talking to. I think... Um, One of the most valuable things that I've done that's kind of helped me, like, stick it, like, stick through the hard days, because you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days, um, is to, when you're having a good day, like, make a note of what that feels like and why you're having a good day and, like, what it is that you love about it. Because I feel like when you have a good day, you're, like, so stoked to have a good day and you just hope that all the other days are like Mm -hmm. that. And then when you have a bad day, that's when you, like, really dig into, like, what did I do wrong? Like, why am I doing this? All this, like, you get really nitpicky about the bad days. Um, But if you get just as, um, if you dig into the good days just as much as the bad days, then you're going to have a lot more to lean back on and fall back on when you have those bad days. Mm -hmm. Um, So remember the good days, however you need to. Like, I would write little letters to myself sometimes in college on good days, like, and then I, when I was having a rough patch, I would go back and read my letters. And sometimes I would get kind of stubborn and be like, what's it going to say? Just that, like, the sun was shining and it was <laughs> right. so happy. And, like, yeah. how's that going to help me? And then I would actually open it up and read it. And, that, and there was all these things I remembered that I had forgotten were part of that great day. Um, so some people are probably better at remembering the good days and remembering the good things than maybe I was. But that was something that was really big for me. Um, as I was developing it's kind of like a deeper version of like what Reed was saying on his podcast but he was thinking more like wins and losses not just like good Mm -hmm. days and bad days but I mean you have more days than you do matches right so yeah Yeah. and I think with beach volleyball there are just so many intangible things that are good whether it's a good or bad day like you could lose but you still got to spend like four hours on the beach. That's what people do <laughs> for vacation. Yeah, like, true. Like people spend thousands of dollars to come like watch the tournaments that we play in and then feel really shitty about because we lost. It's like, well, <laughs> this is actually a really good day. I went <laughs> down to the water's edge after I woke up. <laughs> I sat there and stretched. And then I went and played beach volleyball with my friends. <laughs> in Why front of people. <laughs> yeah. And then two weeks later, I'll and get a paycheck for doing that. <laughs> You can like, you can liter- you can play your best match of your life, something you work super hard at, and lose the match. Yeah, yeah. And then you're mad about it. Yeah. It's like you're mad about. It's so backwards. Cause you're, <laughs> you're mad about doing exactly what you worked hard to do. Yeah. But you didn't get the result. Right. Because the refs are. No. <laughs> <laughs> or something. You know, it could be something completely it's out of your. God dang, ref stand wasn't padded. Because the. F- <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> I had to. I almost. So I was I was staring down the ref stand last week. You know, I was like, if I go drop kick that thing and just. Yeah. Uh, what you said though, oh. it reminded me of uh, this fun habit that Tim Ferriss has. I don't know if you still listen to his podcast a little bit, but he does a thing called the jar of awesomeness. <laughs> 
So he has this jar that he puts on his counter at home, and every day he comes home uh, and puts writes one good thing that happened that day and puts it in the jar of awesomeness. And then, like, halfway through the year, after, like, a bad day, he'll just empty it out and just read his jar of awesomeness. And he's like, what a great day yeah. it was. And it's, uh, it's, fun. it's like a cool little gratitude practice yes. that I think is really good to center yourself, whether it's a good day, a bad day. Like, there's always, especially if, like, your career is beach volleyball. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a lot to be grateful for. Yes. Totally. Glad to have you on. We and got her. We got her. <laughs> we reeled her in finally. The, you, you've been sitting over there for about <laughs> 50 episodes. Finally got you over to the studio. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you for coming on. Let's go barbecue. You shoots. 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 Yeah. <laughs> you know the routine. Peace.